Hello, 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 and welcome to this edition of A Quick Pipe. Now, we've told the news today, today it's bad, and always found a 25-year-old man, and he meets this kind of American accent, which uh, mixes in with an English accent, so you don't really know where you are. And look, here I want to talk about Andrew Tate. I want to talk about the rise of Andrew Tate, and I want to talk about the persecution of Andrew Tate, and I want to talk about why it is uh, that this is going on. And uh, I look at this to some extent in a, a very obscure book I did many years ago, a history book, The Ruler of Cheshire, Sir Pierce Dutton, Tudor Gangland, and the Violent Politics of the Palatine. Now, it seems to me that we are watching the, the collapse of civilization before our very eyes. And I first started writing about this uh, about 10 years ago, but I predicted that it would be something perhaps that would happen within my lifetime. And what's amazed me is how fast it's happening. It's happening, as it were, in real time. Now, one of the things that I noted in a book I wrote with Michael Woodley of Manee, at our wit's end, why we're becoming less intelligent and what it means for the future, was that we had reached a peak of intelligence in about 1870. And that now we were back to where we were in terms of intelligence in about 1600, something like that, using the measure of per capita major innovation, the number of accepted major innovations per million of population per year. Using other metrics, we were back in 1650 or 1700, it depends on what measure, such as... Um, um, uh, the use of high order words in texts, but but uh, using that particular measure, we were back to about the level of 1600 or maybe a little bit earlier than that. And I think that's that's quite interesting because intelligence correlates with social trust. Intelligence correlates with civic values. Intelligence correlates with basically just getting on with people. And so as intelligence goes down, you would expect trust to go down. You would expect civic life to go down. You would expect getting on with people to to go down, and you would expect the balkanization of society, the breakup of society along local lines, along political lines, and generally for just uh, lots of lots of microcosms, lots and lots of sub societies that really don't like each other very much. And people don't really know much about this, but that's exactly what it was like in Tudor England, and it's increasingly what it's like now. And I think what has managed to set it off now is that we've gone from having television with a small number of channels, which perhaps delayed this process occurring because it united the society and it meant that everybody was watching the same thing and bonding over the same thing. And in England, you know, well over half of the population would watch the Morecambe and Wise Christmas special on Christmas Day in the 70s, um, to the rise of the internet, which has uh, facilitated people being able to find a process that would have been occurring anyway beneath the bonnet, as it were, um, of, of, of this breaking up, of this people being more and more different from each other, of low intelligence causing the break of communities. But it accelerated this by permitting people to find lots of other people like them and to create, as it were, ersatz societies, de facto separate uh, microcosmic societies of people like of, of people like them are thus undermining the broad power structure of society undermining the unity of the general society undermining the degree to which the society or the people running the society were really in control and the, uh, the internet has i think managed to accelerate this and this is most obvious with the kind of manosphere incel movement um which which is based around somebody like andrew tate now i person uh, and it, i personally personally find him um, just irritating, that he's, that he's brash, he boasts about money, he whatever. He's not the kind of person that I would get on with. I don't suppose I ever will interview him now, but if I did interview him, I imagine I would get on with him about as much as I got on with Gavin McGuinness. Uh, he, he's not a person that would uh, I, I would click with, I'm, I'm fairly sure. But uh, uh, even so, it's a fairly fascinating thing that he has managed to build up this following. And it is a following which undermines the power structure of society, firstly, because it exists. So it's just dangerous that anybody who is extra governmental, anybody in a, in a democracy or whatever that is outside of the government can have that kind of following, even you know, with Billy Graham or someone like that. There's, or Malcolm X. There's a degree to which it's dangerous that anybody can have a following like that at all. They are a danger to the society. But secondly, what kind of following? Well, there's nothing more dangerous to a society than excluded young men. 
if you have lots of excluded young men, then you have violence. And uh, that's exactly what uh, you, you've had at certain points in history. You've had lots of excluded young men who therefore gang together in groups and, and you end up with violence. And so this is exactly what he's doing. He's appealing to the excluded young men demographic. Um, and not only that, but he is uh, completely, but he's substantially destroying uh, what these young men are supposed to be indoctrinated with and supposed to accept, which is that they're, you know, the, the woke idea that they're rubbish, that they're no good, that they should be ashamed to be men. Uh, and he's telling them to simply stand that on its head and to be overtly chauvinistically male um, and, and thus attack the the new uh, woke religion, I suppose you'd say, the new Protestantism, the new woke religion, which has been instituted after the collapse of our, of our as it were, our Catholicism, the collapse of you know, Western nationalism and, 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 and modernism and whatever, um, as the way of holding society together, as trying to hold together this fractured society. And he, uh, he his message is not is, is is bringing these people together and is making them oppose this and this makes him very dangerous and it makes him dangerous to the extent that it basically needs to be taken out. Now it's uh, in in the terms that we do it now, which is to ruin somebody. Now it's very very similar to what you had in mid sixteenth century England, which was these retinues, which was basically that the government of England controlled London, but they didn't really control anything outside of London. And outside of London, you had this de facto feudalism, where you would have these warlords who would uh, who would control portions of land. Um, and if you uh, were one of their tenants, then they, then they would uh, they would uh, you know you would pay them rent or whatever, or you would you would pay them a percent of your 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 income. Um, you would be part of their retinue in return for them protecting you. And that was how the system worked. So you had the legal system. Yep, there was the legal system. But then there was the fact that, let's say, your retinue, your, your, the leader of your retinue is Sir Piers Dutton, and you're a gentleman that holds land from him. Um, well, he will, uh, and, and you say to him, I've got a bit of a problem. I'm being put on trial for invading somebody else's land and, and farming it as my own in, in their absence. Well, he comes in with his gang and nobbles the jury and interferes with everything and bribes the judge and makes sure that you get off. So that's the system. In return for that, you have to be part of his retinue, his gang of thugs, so that if there's some some I don't know some dispute he has with another warlord in the area, then you're part of his gang that march in and beat up the other gang and and uh, you know, kill any murder. There's, that's in my book. It's just murder members of the other gang um, uh, and, and and ensure that he gets what he wants, which is to control some parcel of land or or to, to get some lucrative uh, sinecure or office of state or, or whatever. Whatever. And that was the entire system of Tudor England. That it really right up to the end of the of the sixty of the seventeenth um, century. These retinues dominated Tudor England. They were they were a second de facto law in the land. Now you have this now in as it were less developed countries. So in a country like Somalia, even within the bit of Somalia that is controlled by the government. So even within Mogadishu, you have the 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 law. Of the Republic of Somalia, and then you have the system of uh, of your clan, and you and your tribe, and and the le the leader of the clan will be called upon and told, look, uh, I'm a member of your clan, um, I'm part of your gang, uh, help me out here, I've been arrested, and the leader of the clan, who's elected often, will, will the Emir of the clan, will then go to the police station and negotiate on your behalf and bribe on your behalf and basically do things to make sure that you you get out. And so he's effectively your, but in return, then when he's in trouble, when he's fighting some leader of some other clan over land or property or whatever it happens to be, uh, you know, in, his, in what, is, what, what is basically a protection racket that he operates, um, then, uh, then, then you will be in his gang and you will beat up the member of the other gang or whatever. That's the quid pro quo. Now, we're, I mean, he, we're seeing something like this developing, I think, with Andrew Tate. We're seeing the rise of the retinue. It's not a retinue based around land, but it's a revenue based around money, access to information, um, access to resources, access to people, access to work, uh, 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 whatever access to just influence in the world. Um, and it be, and you have then a retinue, a, a, a kind of mini state almost. Well, that's too much of an exaggeration, but certainly, certainly a retinue of which he is the head. He controls a large number of people. He will help them by inspiring them and, uh, and and telling them what they should do to get what they want and 
basically giving them information, really. Um, and in return, uh, they will help him by campaigning for him and, and looking out for him and uh, 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 ganging up against those that will try and uh, try and prosecute him or whatever it happens to be. It's effectively a retinue. And I suspect you're going to get more and more of this as society breaks up, more and more retinues. The breakup of the concept of being English or being American or being Romanian and more and more an idea that your identity is based around your relationship with a particular individual. People that were in this chap's retinue would wear his coat of arms um, on various occasions. He was their leader. He was, he was the person around which their identity centred to a much greater extent than the idea that they were English or the idea that they were from Cheshire. Um, and uh, you, you would you would get this the same uh, kind of idea. You get this very very clearly in Afghanistan. The, the sense of identity is based around a particular warlord, uh, or in Iran, the sense of identity is based around a particular religious figure. And this is far more this is far more significant than around the society itself. Uh, and I think the, so. The particular figure like, like like an ayatollah. Um, and so and so I think this is where we're going. And I think the Andrew Tate phenomenon is a fascinating. Uh, indicator of where we are going.